but you know, we're talking about new agents and we brought up the issue about the ibrutinib. And I think uh, one of the questions and some things that we're seeing now, and I think John has uh, got some information on this, is where do we believe that ibrutinib is going to be maybe fitting in or what is the current use of ibrutinib in the first line setting in patients, John? Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is obviously something we're all anticipating potentially could happen in the future. And, you know, we're, we're blessed because we've not had a good therapy for 17P CLL, which only represents about 5% of, pa of patients at the time, 5 to 10% at the time of initial treatment. And ibrutinib was approved for that group. It's, you know, it's it, for initial therapy or salvage therapy. And that's probably you know, where you know, ibrutinib best should be used you know, in initial therapy. There's you know, very promising data from one phase two study showing you know, very you know, extended progression-free survival in, in the majority of patients, great majority of patients treated with ibrutinib. But it's probably too early, in my opinion, you know, outside of the 17P group to be using ibrutinib as initial therapy because you know, as, as ibrutinib is an immunologically modulating drug as well, and anytime you move a drug up to early, earlier therapy, when it affects the immune system, there could be unanticipated events. And I think seeing what the phase three studies show, you know, that are ongoing right now, are going to be important, you know, to discerning if the, the toxicity of ibrutinib as it moves to the upfront setting perhaps changes. The other question would be, uh, you're starting, as we said, you have a number of set cycles when we're using combination immunochemotherapy. I think one of the big questions I have is, how long would you continue ibrutinib once you initiate it? I mean, the panel here, do you, do you really continue monotherapy until the time of progression or the patients either say, I don't want any more of this, it's, I've had enough, or do you wait till you plateau, or do we say until there's toxicity? I'm just curious, whether it's the upfront or in the relapse setting, I think combination therapy is gonna be the future, but for today, what would your recommendation be? Just keep giving the patients ibrutinib indefinitely? So I think that's a very important question that we need to find the answer yeah. to. Yeah. And I think that, you know, for now, one of the things about ibrutinib is that the responses continue to improve over time and that we're seeing patients achieve CRs and MRD negative CRs, you know, at three, four, five years. So these are patients from the very earliest studies. So the question, of course, needs to be answered as to whether or not it's safe to stop in these patients. And there are certain studies now that are going on in basically randomizing discontinuation trials, looking at, you know, whether or not when you discontinue treatment in a patient who is MRD negative, we're not putting the patient in, in at harm's risk. But what harm's risk? You're saying if you stop the MRD negative, the disease is coming back? The disease comes back. Might it be a way to breed resistance? Might it be a way to... So I think that it's certainly less therapy is always better as long right. as we're not denying the patient something that's effective. And you're talking about these patients who are getting MRD negative responses at, you know, years down the road. But what does that mean though, clearly, Rich? If you get an MRD negative patient, you stop it and the disease comes back, then that doesn't have the same meaning. I, I'm not sure. I, I, using very sensitive means, we haven't seen a lot of MRD negative responses. I think we could see complete responses, but invariably we find leukemia cells in the marrow in some numbers. Uh, some not in MRD numbers. So I, I've not um, seen personally any patient have eradication of the disease. So that gives some rationale for continuous therapy. I do think that MRD, and I believe we're going to talk about sure. that, minimal residual disease is a very important therapeutic endpoint. And as we push the envelope to sensitivities now at one in 10,000 cells down to one in a million, sure. I think it's gonna be essential because if we're gonna ever cure this disease, that's gotta be our endpoint. Right? Yeah. We gotta get rid of it. Let's go, yeah, Rich, we'll bring But you know, I think the thing that's important to keep in mind yes. is, you know, granted, you know, if a patient, you know, these patients who are achieving CRs at, you know, years mm -hmm. down the road are the subgroup of patients who are tolerating the drug well, who are not having any complications. And I think it behooves us to keep in mind that if a patient's responding to a drug and not having any toxicities, to really try to encourage the patients to stay on therapy until we have the data that suggests that it's, we're not putting them in harm's risk by discontinuing therapy when they do get to an excellent response. I guess, I guess the, the only thought I have is that any agent that's giving me a great response and I stop it and the disease is coming back that they're already have selected out, maybe that cells are resistant, maybe not refractory and they're growing through, but we're just controlling that 
those cancer cells from growing. It's just having them basically going into suspended uh, animation. I agree. I, I, I think I we're saying the same thing yeah. about not discontinuing. Right. I, I think we're say so we're discounting. You know, the, uh, these kinase inhibitors inhibit the uh, B cell receptor signaling mm -hmm. through BTK or PI3 kinase delta, but when they move, when they're also immunologically active, outside of the direct effect on the COL cell, they revert immune suppression that's seen with the disease, and there, say, when you look in the untreated group of patients, there are patients on the initial abrutinib cohort that went off study and haven't relapsed. So when they went off drug and haven't relapsed. And, we have, and so we have to, I think this issue of how long we're gonna treat has to be looked at in the context of, of whether patients are heavily pretreated or untreated. And because there are other models, and I believe with, as we look forward to the kinase inhibitors, we could see COL being a disease like hairy cell, where you, you, you give, a nucleoside analog cladribine, right. and you can see minimal residual disease, but patients have remissions that are very, very durable. They may not need to be treated again, and, and the immune system sort of finds a way to control the disease after you knock it down. I believe that's true, and, but if you have a test for minimal residual disease and you're confident in the uh, test and the patient's doing well without any evidence of measurable disease, um, I, I subscribe to the notion that there's no treatment on the planet that doesn't have some risk to it. And I personally have even argued uh, some of the newer therapies we're going to talk about, ABT199 venetoclax, I actually argue that we stop some of our patients uh, and have the first patient stopping therapy when they became MRD negative. And I've been following now for over a year and a half without any recurrence and are still in complete remission. So. I think if we can achieve that status of getting treatment, get into a complete remission, and allow for the patient to get off therapy and lead normal lives, that's, our, that's my uh, really ultimate goal. We have a couple more.